Because uh, so uh, <clears throat> someday I'm going to uh, do kind of a non-technical session based on the ideas skills I got. Uh, I thought of going with the non-technical session, so we are not going to do any coding here. We basically will be discussing a set of details, uh, things that you can do with these LLMs, how you can integrate details, uh, different things, etc. And some of the details. Um, so in that scenario, uh, so even if you are not a technical person, you are pretty good with the, the session since you are not having technical scenarios. Um, so to begin with the uh, content, what I have is, uh, first of all, I'll give a brief uh, introduction about LLM because uh, mostly people refer to these uh, technologies like AI models. So most people know it as mostly catchy. That's uh, only thing most of the people are familiar with. So we we'll go through a bit of basic of uh, LLMs and then I'll jump to an area called prompt engineering. So we'll see what you mean by prompt engineering, why we need prompt engineering, what's the big deal of prompt engineering. And then we'll see some challenges, so I would say risk of uh, LLMs. So some of the key drawbacks what we have with these technologies. And then uh, we'll see some, you know, how do we actually integrate custom data or sometimes uh, private data <clears throat> or the latest data, how do we actually integrate with the uh, uh, latest technologies. And then uh, we'll see some open access LLMs, open source LLMs and some of the tools. And finally, I'll share some uh, industrial use cases. Basically, the, the things I'm going to share at the end is basically what I have worked with. Not that, uh, so if I am sharing things, actually even you can find in the internet so no point. So here the details will be the projects that we have worked with uh, in my career as well as in the consultant side. So uh, I'll share a couple of uh, projects uh, where you can actually do with LLM uh, some interesting projects. <clears throat> okay, so moving on. So as a basic uh, overview, so an example now, if I say ChatGPT, most of you guys know what you mean by ChatGPT because it has become a hype, okay, and people refer to it as an AI model, but only technical people actually refer to it as LLM. okay? But technically, all these ChatGPT, but uh, all these you know, chat applications, what we have nowadays, fall under a category called large languages. Okay. But in public, you know, in general, people use them as AI tools. So, you know, uh, mostly they know only chat. Okay? That's what we have. Okay. But the question is, okay, why do we call them large language model is the biggest thing. But the term large actually becomes uh, because these models have been trained on a very huge data set. The data set itself is an enormous data set. And to understand this much of a huge data set, you need to have a complex brain. Okay. So the algorithm or the techniques are pretty complex. Now, if you uh, have seen most of these tools, once they release these tools, they use like, okay, we have one billion parameters, one trillion parameters. So they actually refer with the number of tunable parameters they have. So they want to quantify, okay, we have the biggest one. Technically, it's not that you know, the biggest model wins the race, so it's not that the biggest model is the better they are. I know very uh, small model which actually outperform big ones. So whatever it is, how they actually quantify the complexity or the uh, size of the model is using the complexity or the tunable parameters. Okay, so one thing is the data set is big, plus the model is complex, and then how come the language in computer picture is? Now, in simple, if you go to ChatGPT, you type in, in a plain text, right? So we go the natural language, whatever the language you actually are comfortable with. And they understand it, right? And at the end, they reply you back with set of answers. Again, you can understand. So basically, communication happens in natural languages. You can understand as well as the model can understand. So that is why we actually call them language models. So all together, large data set plus a uh, complex model and the language behavior before the large language models. And then the next question is, okay, how do they actually know all this stuff? Where are the data sources? How do they actually gain all this uh, detail? That is where the most common thing is if you go to internet, you have millions of pages. Okay, millions of pages are, millions of books are. So in simple terms, you go to 
all the publicly available web pages that scrape them. Get all the publicly available books. There are plenty of publicly available databases. Okay, and if you go to research site, okay, you have journal articles, you have conference uh, conference uh, details, you have proceedings, you have the theses, all these are there. You get everything. And if you go to uh, the movie sites, okay, you have videos, you have audio, you have photos, you have movie scripts, you can get everything which are available. And finally, if you see the social media, that is one of the biggest way you can get uh, data sets. Because if you go to a social media, okay, every single day, you get uh, social media, you get enormous data set feed. Okay, if you go to social media, you have only publicly available data, you don't actually get the private data. Okay, so all this data, what you do is you simply download it and you give it to these models and you go. So if someone asks you, okay, what do you mean by these large language models, say chat GPT in very simple terms like this. Now think of scenario, I read one book and I might know certain things from that. If I read one million books, I might know many things. Most of the questions I get, I will be able to answer. That is something similar to these models. So they have gone through a lot. They know a lot. With that, actually, they can answer many things. And then actually, frankly speaking, these uh, AI hype actually got, we got, um, End of last year, right? So with the uh, chat GPT hype, so we got this, okay, we, most of people got to know, okay, we have something like this, okay, AI books are the thing, etc. But technically speaking, we had these, uh, you know, natural language processing models from a long time. If you see, uh, we had a model called uh, RN actually That's actually an algorithm. We are written a new letter since uh, 1988. Okay, and we had some issues with that algorithm, and we got another people came up with another algorithm called LSTA, long short term, uh, short term memory. After that, until recent past, actually we were using LSTA for all our chatbot applications. Most of the chat applications, chatbots we had were actually powered by LSTA majority. Of them. And then in 2017, we got a breakthrough with the attention models. Google came up with a new architecture. That's where the, actually the turning point of most of these LLM models. So then all the GPT models, but all these models actually will on top of that algorithm, the technology. So we call it the architecture. Okay. It's not that a new thing. Only thing happened was open AI actually they disrupted the market. So actually they introduced this chat GPT in a you know large scale in a very uh, uh, important. So, uh, so with that LLM scenario, what happens is with the uh, open AI's market not only actually now within a short time of period since last year to 2022, end of 2022 to end of 2023, we have actually large number of LLM speed. So you can't create an LLM in a short time period because we had most of these stuff in the pipeline. But ChatGPT was the first one to market, and then everyone started, okay, we should put it uh, out in LLA, and then Google came into picture, and uh, Meta came into picture, all these models actually, uh, quickly, quickly, we got some models. So whatever the thing, okay, now we have uh, LLMs. Then now, technically, what you do is, if you go to the most famous one, ChatGPT, you go and type things, right? So whatever you type into these AI algorithms, chat gpt and all these spots we call them a prompt for query okay so how we have to type this thing determine the answer you get same thing if you type in two different thing ways you will get back to two different answers for example if you see this one okay now imagine this uh, the left side one you have the fireworks if you type fireworks you get the uh, left side by mistake if you type okay fire space work, so you know in two different words you totally get a, so you get a totally different answer. You can't blame the model, that's what you ask. Okay, because my mistake or whatever it is, that's what you ask. So you have to be very careful with what you actually type in, what, how you type. Okay, it's not that you get penalized, only thing is the answer you get may be totally different. Okay, now as an, another example, now imagine uh, somehow you say, uh, came up with a, 
Um, kalau saya kontam tu ambil ni, Islam something like you know, very basic word, uh, kind of a very technical term. You go to Jadji, maybe you can see this uh, left side one, uh, and you type what is kontam tu, because you want to know what you mean by kontam tu. And you get this answer. You can see the left side one, very good, on point answer, very detailed answer, nicely done. But the issue is if you read it, it's fully technical, but Imagine if you are an untechnical person, what will happen? So you will not be able to understand it. Even I don't think, even if a technical person, some of the terms might not be uh, understand. So you can't again uh, blame the model because that's what you ask. You ask what is quantum computing? It explains quantum computing nicely. Okay, but if you see the top right corner here, if I put it in this way, okay, I'm telling you, okay, A is like this ChatGPT. Uh, You are an expert in quantum computing. I'm basically telling, okay, you know quantum computing that uh, in a really good way. Plus, you have a experience in ten years of experience in teaching. So why that is because now there are technical experts they can't teach. Here, what I'm telling is, you are an expert plus a good teacher. So you should be able to teach. And then I'm telling, okay, now the thing is, okay, I have the recording idea. has stopped. Quantum computing. Please explain me quantum. Computing. This meeting is being recorded. At the same time, if you can see, at the end, what we have is I'm telling you, it's like this. when you explain things. The only thing is actually I'm a six-year-old baby. You need to explain me with some example. So why we tell something like that is because now if you are explaining something to a small kid, what happens is you don't explain it in a very technical way. You know? So you are going to be very simple. You are going to use very simple. Things. So for the model, I'm telling you, okay, you explain me quantum quantum computing, but only thing is explain it in a, such a way you explain to a very small kid. So you get this right side answer. It's very simple. You can see the same thing I asked in two different ways, and I got completely two different answers. That's the power of this prompt engineering. In simple terms, how you actually type. Okay, we have got a new area called prompt engineering. Now we got the LLMs. Now we are actually learning how to integrate with LLMs. Okay, and based on the experience, based on what we have done, I have actually came up with a very uh, simple template. It's not actually a rule. It's a very basic template that I have actually uh, came up with. First, when you are type, when you are prompting, you can actually set the context. The context in the sense, uh, you tell the model, okay, this is your base, this is your background, this is the way you should think. From this side, you start uh, your logic. Okay. So that is what you call the context. You set up the context. You tell the model the background of it, and then you tell your deep learning. Okay, this is what I. Want. And finally, the way you want the output. If you want the output in a tabular structure, you tell okay, I want the uh, output as this. If you want the output as a JSON or any format you wish, if it is provided, okay, you can tell okay, this is the way I want. So basically, then what will happen is model will understand. Okay, this is my base, and this is what the user is expecting, and this is what, how I should reply. Okay. So likewise, there are few uh, ways you can uh, prompt to this LLM. The way very very basic one is the zero shot one. In simple terms, you simply ask the question straightforward. Directly you ask the question. No examples now. Now, for example, if you see this uh, screenshot. So now you have a uh, you know review. The review is the room uh, was uh, spacious, but the service was terrible. So you have what kind of a mixed uh, you know review. What you want now is simply you want to see whether the clients are happy with you or not, whether the users are happy. Okay, is the sentiment is negative? Am I getting a negative? That's what you want to see. So here, what I'm telling is, okay, simply send the uh, review and ask, okay, is it positive or negative? Straightforward. On the other hand, you can actually tell the large language model with some examples. Okay, you ask the okay, question plus you give some give some examples. So that is the we call the few shot prompt. Few shot is basically you are giving some examples, and there's another way, uh, one shot. Basically, in one shot, what happens is. Uh, You give only one uh, example, okay? So most common one is the few short, basically. 
So if you can see this example, I'm telling, okay, I want set of strategies for revenue management. In revenue management, I need some strategies. But the only thing is I know only three. I don't have any idea about more than three. So I'm telling the three steps I need. I know the strategies I know and I'm asking the model, okay, you give me the others. So here I'm giving three examples. So the model has to learn from these three examples and give me output. Okay. That is what you call a few short. So you give some examples. Okay. And then one of the most uh, efficient way of prompting is we have something called chain of thought. We call them uh, COT. In that case, actually what happens is rather than getting the output straight away, so you, take, you actually guide the model in such a way, the algorithm will follow say a certain thought process. It will say, follow a set of steps. Okay, now for example, if you see these uh, examples, first of all, I'm telling you, okay, setting up the context, all these are uh, you know, type, if you want, you can uh, type these things and see. Um, you are saying, okay, you are the manager of say a transportation company. And you have these 50 trucks and consumption of one truck is uh, six miles per gallon, and you have uh, 100 miles per day uh, on average. So, as the manager, now you should uh, bring some strategies to reduce the uh, fuel cost. Okay. So, if you ask this straight away, what will happen is, okay. It will give you some basic things like, okay, you need to drive like this, etc. Et but it might not be methodical. Here what happens is you tell it in such a way, okay, you tell it in such a way. So the model tells you in such a way, model tells, okay, you need to drive in this way. And if you increase the fuel efficiency even by 5%, it will, the efficiency will jump to 6.3 from 6. That will end up with 100 gallons per day, the same. Okay, so now if you see this example, the model has gone through a thought process. We are to start and we are to end, and what are the steps? And with the quantification, you have the answers, numbers. So you can simply go and produce, present this to anyone. It has the answers. Now, if you can calculate, if you see the calculations, it's correct. So, likewise, in chain of thought, in COT, what happens is you uh, go through the model. In a, you actually take the model through a uh, thought process rather than basically getting the answer straight, straight away. Okay. And then actually with the, this large language model, we have an issue, not actually an issue, that's how they are. So they are basically random. Random in the sense, if you are the same question a couple of times, you might get different answers. So there are ways to uh, tackle that because uh, there are parameters like temperature. So you can actually handle that uh, randomness. But naturally, they actually don't tell you the same thing two times. Okay. That might be an issue when we have these uh, automations. So if you are to automate something, if you get you know, different, different answers, technically you can't. Okay. So then what will happen is we have another way of integrating, you know, interacting with uh, models with the self consistency. In simple terms, you ask the same question a couple of times and you get the most probable answer or the you know the most common answer. In that case, it might be wrong, but that's the most common answer. Okay, even though it is uh, wrong, it might be the most common answer. In that scenario, what happened? Now, if you see this uh, uh, screenshot, if you see this screenshot, what we have is now, we have this uh, basic, you know, my age scenario. If you ask the same thing a couple of times, mostly you get uh, different, different answers. So in... Uh, self consciousness what happens is, out of all the answers you get, you get the majority or the most common answer, or the most probable answer. That is to, you know, tackle these uh, randomness issues. Okay. There are other ways, but you can use self consistency just to tackle these issues. Okay. And then the final one we have is, okay, in chain of thought, what happens is you simply take it through a thought process. But if you are to go through kind of, say, uh, a logical flow. Thought process might be logical, might not be logical. Okay. But if you are to uh, take the model in a logical pathway, okay, rather than in a basic pathway, what happens is if you are writing a software or a code, it should be a logical and without logic, you don't write. Okay. So in that scenario, you can actually 
get the model to follow certain logical path is and actually give you an output with intermediate steps. Okay, you have each and every step with the output and the reasons. Okay, in that case, actually, usually we can use these kind of things for reason. Now there are scenarios. Okay, you might simply get the output. But how do you actually uh, defend this output? How do you reason? Uh, for example, if we say tomorrow is going to rain, and how do we actually uh, back up this out? Okay, how can we tell tomorrow is raining? What are the basics? Okay, how do we actually come to that uh, conclusion? Those are the steps. Intermediate things actually we have to calculate, we have to analyze logically, and then come to the final answer. Okay, that is what we do with this, you know, programmed. Uh, language okay and then okay these actually prompt engineering what happens is you simply interact with the model and how you actually get the best output from the model and then whatever it is okay now you are okay with the prompt you can type but the thing is when it comes to large language model they come up with certain uh, limitation and risk okay the most common one we have is something called hallucinations in simple terms, it tells you, you know, false stories. Okay. Most of the time, if you ask uh, questions from these, say, large language models, they will give you an answer, majority of the time. Whether it's true or false, most of the time you get an answer. Okay. There are scenarios, they give you false answers. So they actually create answers which is not there. That is what we call the hallucinations. That is actually very common uh, issue in uh, large language model. It's pretty hard to avoid, but there are techniques to avoid. And how actually we get this kind of issue is there can be data issues. That in simple terms, the model has not been trained on that scenario where you ask. Okay, but somehow it comes with a totally different story. And then there can be you no know, fine tuning issues. Fine tuning issues mean now whatever the model you are using, those are because the machine learning. In simple terms, you have a data, you have an algorithm. The algorithm is actually learning from the data. So when they learn, there can be issues. We have we call them you know, overfitting issues, underfitting issues. So there can be training issues or fine-tuning issues. In simple terms, the issues you actually uh, get while you're learning. Okay. Based on that, due to that, you might get these uh, false answers. That's a very common in a uh, large language. So that is why we tell, uh, we actually tell you don't trust anything uh, out of the box from these large language models. Okay. And then next one is we have something called bias. Because the thing is, even though we have this data, okay, there can be situations the data set may be coming from majority from one side. For example, imagine if chat GPT was uh, trained mostly from, say, insurance set. So most of the data it knows from insurance. Then what happens is if you are something other than insurance sector, the model might not be able to answer because it has a bias towards the insurance sector. That is where it has been trained on. If those issues are there with LL. And then privacy and these issues. That is one of the most common uh, questions uh, I have seen. Even though we see okay, these models are pretty good. Into these pretty uh, good models, but people don't want to share their private data. But you know, if you see like ChatGPT and all, what they claim is they don't use our private data once we prompt it. That's what they claim. We never know, right? So people don't want to share private data, and we have some trust issues with the security because most of the big players uh, in recent past we had some you know data breaches and data leakage, etc. So people don't. Still, we have issues sharing our private data. And, you know, still we have the compliance issues, now regulations, you can't share certain data. That is another story. But even if you can share, even if you are not bounded by regulations, still we have the issues like, okay, we don't want to share data due to security issues. That is another. Thing. And then we have another. Okay. The transparency. Now, okay, we saw the data sources Imagine you know, most of the data sources where the data is coming towards this large language models. But what happens is once you get an answer, now if you go to say a research paper, if you are writing an assignment, okay, we have to give the references where we got these answers based on what I'm telling this 
answer. But when it comes to large language models, the answer you get is not actually refer reference. So you don't know where this answer came uh, came up. There can be data which the model was trained on. It might have issues, issues in the sense of uh, the legitimate issues. We might not be able to trust those data. Okay, so we might have trust issues with the data itself. So since we don't have the transparency where the models is and models are actually giving the outputs, it also an issue with these LL. Okay, and one of the major thing we have with these uh, author, you know, authorship. Okay, now you might have seen you know, if you get an answer most, most of the time. What I have seen is uh, so since I do a couple of lectures then and there. Once you get the assignment, you get the picture. Copy and paste to ChatGPT for any model. Get the answer. Copy it to another large language model. Paraphrase it. Put it to the side. Okay, there are plenty of things like that. So with these LLM. It's pretty easy to do an assignment nowadays. Okay, and if you see this creative work generation now, we have this um, creative content uh, creator, creators. So if you create, say, an image today, a new image, the same image might be generated by to another person by the same model. Okay, because these are models, they do, you, you can't get the copyrights for a model or a uh, artwork or creative work generated by a model. Okay, so we have these authorship issues and plenty of plagiarism issues. So same thing you can be, you may find in different places. Okay. And one of the major thing I have seen is the manipulation because uh, personally I have heard people, okay, most of these, you know, even technical guys, what I have heard is people think like, okay, the chat GPT is the thing, now we don't need search engines. A search engines, say Google, people think, okay, we don't need Google now because we have chat GPT. Now, if you go to search engine, what happens is you go and type something, you get search results and you have to go through them. And then you have to read the thing and get the answer. But if you go to say chat GPT, what happens is you simply get the answer, whether it's correct or wrong, you get one answer. So if you tend to believe these answers, what happens is you can manipulate the large language models and you can give answers and you can simply manipulate the behavior of people. If, if they tend to believe the outputs, and if you temper the large language models, you can simply give false uh, manipulated answers, so the people will believe them. Okay, so those are you know the common, not the not technical issues. These are kind of common uh, challenges. I actually uh, <clears throat> want to share with you guys. There are plenty of other uh, risks as well, but here what I wanted to uh, show you was the uh, the common and the non-technical uh, issues with. The hallucination is kind of technical, but it's again uh, a common issue we have. And then the the key topic we are going to discuss today is okay. Now, if you see Chat GPT, the data knowledge base of Chat GPT is actually up to 2021, 2021 September. And in the latest model, what they claim is they have the knowledge base up to um, say uh, 2023 April. Okay. So whatever it is now, if you uh, uh, you know, want to say get some details, say last month, these models are not being able to tell you the details. And if you want to get okay, you want data. Now, for example, if you get some government circulars, <coughs> ChatGPT doesn't know about our government circulars, but still, if you want to get some details of government circulars, okay, some you know, uh, our newspaper, you know, details, news uh, uh, stuff, and all, they have no idea. So if you want to actually input these details and if you want to use them, that is where we are actually doing something called custom data or IO data integration. Okay. So one of the most common way you can do is uh, we source prompt engineering. In prompt engineering, what we do is we simply type certain things so that actually LLM will give us the output. So what we can do is once we type these stuff, okay. And we get this data, okay, whatever the data you want, you put them into the prompt and you send it. I imagine if you have an Excel sheet of, uh, say, 100,000 records, you put the detail into the prompt, send it. And the LLM will analyze and give you the answer. That is totally doable. Okay. You send your data with the prompt itself. Okay. That is one way of doing it. Okay. But the thing is, 
these LLMs, they have a li what, limitation called <coughs> token limitations. Token limitation means, now in prompt you are typing things, okay, for example, tokens are not the words, but for instance, we'll think, okay, the words, number of word count is not the technical explanation, but think, okay, token means a word. So if you count the number of words you are giving to the model plus the output, the total should be less than the token limit of the model. Now, if you see that GPT-4, they have 32K uh, token and we have 8K um, models. That means you can go up to 8,000 tokens or 30, uh, 2,000 tokens in total. Okay. But the issue is, if you have a large data set, you can't do this, right? So that means once you put your data into the prompt, it will ex exceed the token uh, count. Okay. So that might not be a feasible solution that if you have a small. And then the other option we have is we have something called model fine tuning. Now, in fine tuning, what we try to do is we don't try to train a large language model from our side. That is not going to be practical. So then as normal uh, people, I don't think we have that um, capability to train any model like ChatGPT. That's not going to be practical. So what we do is we use a technology called technique called transfer learning. In simple terms, I imagine if you know a person who can play guitar, you can teach the same person to play mostly another instrument because that person knows music. That person has that you know music favor. Okay, and then you can teach something else another uh, scenario. So likewise, in uh, model fine tuning, what happens is here, you have the base model. Base model is the model you uh, have been trained on. Okay. So in this scenario, now you have your custom data. Okay. You have the custom data and you actually train the model. You have the base model, the train on data, normal data. And you put your custom data and you teach the model. So compared to the data the model has been trained on, this model is very small. That is given. But actually, this data set is not something the model has been has seen. Okay. So in simple terms, you are actually training these complex models in a small scale. That's a separate story, but somehow you're actually teaching. Okay. And then you get some people fine-tune LLMs. That's one way of giving your data. Okay. And when you uh, fine tune these models, there are a couple of ways you can fine tune. One way is we call something called uh, <coughs> federated learning. So federated learning is actually not up to the LLMs. Actually, even uh, before the LLM comes into picture, we have this federated learning. Now imagine you have three companies. So you want to uh, train a model with our custom data. So what you can do is, Rather than sharing the data into a central server, it works as a you know, client server architecture. Rather than sharing your data to a third party, what you do is you tell, okay, you give me the model. Okay. I'll, I'll train it in my side. So I will not give my data to someone else. I'll train from my side and I'll give you the model. So likewise, each and every company will train the model separately and give it to the central repo. So then the central repo will combine everything together and create one model. So the final model will have all the data from all these companies. So you did not share the details, but what happened was the data actually got learned by the uh, models. That is one thing. And it will be shared by everyone. Okay. So each and every technique has its pros and cons that we will uh, we have to admit. Okay. And the other one is, okay, here what happens is even though you don't share data, the model actually knows your data. If you don't like that, we have another option. We have something called SMPC or secure multi-party uh, computation. It's actually in simple, it's a cryptography uh, way of doing it. In simple terms, what happens is your data is in. Okay. So you encrypt your data and you give it to the trade. So what happens is the model doesn't know whose data that is. Okay. And Basically, data is shuffled, data is uh, uh, cross-shared. So then what will happen is, even though the model sees the data, they don't know whose data, what this data is, since those are a kind of entry. And then at the end, you get the final LLM, same as the other ones. 
and share with the others. Okay. But if you feel like, okay, you don't care about, you know, you don't like training. So actually training is technically you need some resources. Yes. You feel like, no, I don't want to train in your space. I don't like that, uh, training. I don't want to take this as a, then you have one option. One of the most uh, common option I would say. This uh, RH, your retrieval of content. That is the most common thing we see is now you have your data, but the thing is you store your data in such a way in a separate type of databases we call the vector databases. Okay. So I'll tell you vector database, how the vectorization happens on the next slide. So you have the normal database and you actually store them in a totally separate uh, database or vector databases in a totally different way. Your data will be stored as vectors in simple terms and array of numbers. Even if it is a web page, video, uh, say entire book, photos, it will be converted into a vector, or in simple terms, uh, an array of numbers and stored in a vector database. So, likewise, we have vector database like Pine, Code, Chrome, uh, and uh, Redis, or we have this uh, from uh, you know FAISS. Those are a couple of you know very common vector databases. In simple terms, now you have seen MySQL, Oracle, those are normal databases, we call them RDBMS. Likewise, the vector databases are special kind of databases where you store vectors. Okay. And then what happens is, first of all, now earlier what happened was once you prompt something, it goes to LLM. And this time what happens is the prompt will go to the <coughs> vector store. It goes to the vector store and it gets the most relevant or the most uh, uh, common information before going to the LLM. Now in prompt engineering, what happens was we send everything here. We don't send everything. You get the most relevant details. And then how do we get the most relevant details is can be cosine symbol. In simple terms, uh, now these are vectors. You get the similarity between vectors. In simple terms, you check, okay, how similar these two vectors are. And you get the most similar vectors. What else? There are scenarios like in gram In gram overlap means now each and every uh, details you have tokens. You can check okay how many in grams are or how many tokens are overlapping. Or else you can check the semantic uh, magic, semantic similarity between uh, data. So whatever it is, due to some you know with some technique you get the similarity, and then you bring those data back, and that is the data you send it to the LLM. Earlier we sent everything. Here we don't send every single data. We send only the selected portion of data. Okay, and then you get the output. So the LLM can be anything. It can be OpenAI, GPT, it can be BARD, it can be Llama from Meta. It can be any model. Okay, whatever the model, you send only selected data. Now we have to keep uh, one thing in mind here: the output, the quality of the output actually depend on the quality of the data actually sent to the uh, the model. If you get very good data from this search, okay, if your searching is really good and your vectorization is really good, then you get, you know, very good answers because you are giving very good data to analyze by the LLM. Okay. So when it comes to vectorization, what happens is uh, usually structured data is, well, in terms of tabular data, if the data is in a tabular form, it is really easy to vectorize. But things like videos, photos, um, you know, images, the audio, it's not that easy to convert into vectors in simple terms. Now, if you have a video, a movie, you have to convert that movie into a set of numbers. It's not that easy. So that is why we use something called deep learning models. Okay. With these deep learning models, we convert them into vectors. So technically, what we do is in production, we use the same, this LLM to, to do that. So you get the LLM to convert the data into vectors so that we don't have any, you know, uh, technology businesses. So LLM is the one who actually converted our data. Plus, they are the one who's actually analyzing it. So they, they have the compatibility, then we don't have to worry about any compatibility issues. Okay. And with all these things, okay, whether you want to fine tune, whether you want to go ahead with RAG, we have concerns like, okay, if you go to chat JPD, that is paid. You have to pay for uh, usage. So then if you don't want to pay 
uh, for the services what you can do is you can go it with this open there are two things we have open source llms and open uh, access open access means you can freely access but you don't have the source open source you have both so one of the best model we have seen is most of these models i'm showing you here are practically we have used okay so there are plenty of models but the models i'm showing you here the things i have practically used and uh, felt these are very good ones so one of the best model is llama okay llama to comes from meta so very good model so you can use for many applications instead of uh, chat gpt if you want more to pay and this cloud two is there and falcon is a very nice model and this opt uh, 175b is actually again from meta so very nice model same as llama 2 and even t5 uh, it comes from google okay so like guys there are open source models so if you feel like okay now the ways the techniques we discussed earlier you share the data with llms you may feel like okay whatever the technique i have to give the data so if you feel like no i don't want to share my data on any way what you can do is you can get a, one of these uh, right, open source open access llms you can host them locally so then you don't have to worry about the others if you say chat gpt you have send it to chat gpt search but if you get llama 2 if you have computation power you simply download it you host it locally okay and you use it then you don't have to worry about the data leakage because that runs on promise so we have done that uh, in search models what we do is we get it from them locally so then you don't have to worry anything about the model uh, issues the data issues okay and then i want to introduce you a very small uh, thing called these uh, some software tools now up to now what we discussed was uh, how do we actually use these models take okay and then every technology once you get a new technology there are also wrappers coming into picture now if you see uh, the plenty models what we had first first we had tensorflow and then we got another uh, you know platform called keras keras was actually a wrapper of tensorflow it is easy to use likewise everything we discuss so far can be done using set of tools okay one of the most common tool we have is langchain langchain and agent gpt llama and it is a set of i would say orchestrative tools or you know set of i would say libraries so they offer you the uh, capability to use these uh, you know large language models easily okay you can integrate all these uh, vector databases you can you know they offer even you know now if you see langchain one of the most common ones they offer you uh, prompt templates okay you can uh, connect large number of uh, you know these uh, databases uh, sorry uh, the language models you can combine multiple prompts together with the uh, prompt templates okay and they have something called agent approach you can simply create agents okay it's a very uh, cool technique with langchain so you have even agents to be created with uh, langchain so likewise everything we discuss so far you can easily done by these tools like langchain so if you are creating any llm based products these langchain and llama index are the you know one of the best uh, selections you can make to get these products done okay and finally what i want to touch is set of uh, industrial of things here the products as i said the, the projects we have actually work and we have deployed now, for example uh, if you see this medicine classification Uh, when it comes to insurance industry, some uh, drugs actually are not being covered by the insurers, so vitamins and cosmetics are not being covered. So we had a, an issue like uh, there was a manual process. People check these drugs, and based on their expertise, they classify the various stuff. So what we did was we got the help of LLMs. Once we get the bills, we we have our own OCR models. We get the details in the computers, send them to LLMs. Get it classified. Simple as that. And then we did a very cool project uh, for again uh, in this uh, insurance side. Now there are situations where uh, now imagine if you have diabetics, usually people don't expose it to the 
insurance companies since they don't yes. because they don't get the claims. But if you go to doctor, they don't type write that you have diabetes, but they prescribe you diabetes medicine. Okay, so we had a couple of uh, you know machine learning models to detect that. So even though you know doctor doesn't write, but based on drugs, actually we predict okay whether this person is having these hidden ailments or not, hidden issues or not. So based on that, uh, so once we get this LLM help, so we actually enhance that model with uh, large language models. And we improve all this. So it improved a lot because uh, with these LLMs, they know vast number of uh, drugs and diseases. With that, we have been able to improve quite a lot. And then now, if you have see something like sentiment analysis. <clears throat> now, sentiment analysis, actually, most of the companies, they want to know how clients are actually reacting towards the company. Okay. I have seen companies, they spend a lot to buy tools to get the sentiment analysis uh, models. But nowadays, with these LLMs, you don't have to worry about any of these models. Earlier, we had to create these models, train them, update them. But now, if you get an email or if you get any reviews in your social media, repeat, send it to LLM, you get the sentiment easily. Okay. So, likewise, when it comes to these uh, large language model usage, they are pretty good with analysis. Okay, they are pretty good with anomaly detections, fraudulent activities, risk analysis. Now, if you have heard some people churn prediction in insurance, we do some people labs and other companies, you know, other sectors, we call them churn prediction. Now, earlier churn prediction was a thing, you know, the thing in most of the companies we go telco, they do that. But nowadays you don't have to worry about churn prediction models because you just keep the data into a LLM, get it predicted. Now, if you are worrying about, okay, uh, the phone numbers are shared, the model doesn't matter about the phone numbers, you simply analyze it, or uh, change the numbers, you encrypt the numbers, you don't share the private data, okay? So you share only the transactional data and get it predicted. So with this LLM, what I want to highlight is there are many things you can simply get it done without investing much on the machine learning more. In simple terms, you don't have to worry about investing on data scientists, okay? So if you have even a very good data engineer who's good with data pipelines, you can simply get most of the projects done. It's that easy with these LLM. Now, we have issues. So, so you know, we have certain issues, but the thing is, even though we have issues, now we have to adapt to AI, the LLMs, because that is the thing going to be in future. Now, yesterday, Google introduced their largest uh, multi-model, okay? So in a couple of months, another company will introduce another model. So now it's kind of a competition and everyone is going to introduce new, new things. Okay. So whether you like it or not, we have to adapt to it. So only thing we can do is this. We'll, we have, we'll adapt to them and we'll get the maximum out of this and create your own projects. Okay. If you don't want to spend, you go for, for okay. <clears throat> so this fine tuning and rack is actually, fine tuning and rack is totally two different things because uh, uh, fine tuning actually can go wrong to be honest because now you are actually training a model with your own data and these are not you know very basic models we call these are actually neural based models neural based models training is actually an idea okay based on my experience because traditional machine learning models the you know parameters you have to work with is quite limited whereas when it comes to neural models is quite big. Okay. So the model training might go well as well as the other way. So once you try to fine tune, sometimes you might ruin the model. That is one thing. And fine tuning, you need computation power. Okay. And you have to pre prepare your data so that the model can actually learn. So in data science, the basic uh, logic we have is if you give garbage in, you give garbage out. So the quality of the data determines the output of the model. So fine tuning has those issues. When you are as rack, you don't do any fine tune. In uh, rack, what we do is we get the information and we actually go to the LLM. Okay, we tell LLM, okay, here it's like this. I have this question and these are the data relevant to that question. You check this data and give me the answer. So that is something we do with rack. In rack, we don't uh, touch the model. We actually get the uh, output of the model. So analysis. Uh, 
can't we create a model to solve complicated programming models? It's like this. You can train models. Now, if you want to uh, do this programming stuff, there are ones like Palm 2. They are pretty good with uh, programming. So you can get the help of Palm 2 and all these models. But practically, based on my experience, training a model, I don't encourage in terms of large language. Uh, fine tuning a model, I don't encourage unless it is really needed. But uh, competitive programming problems, you can actually get it done with prompts. That is global. When we run Lama to run local with private consumers, so many. Okay. Uh, so if you see Lama uh, model, so if you say Lama 7B model, those are quite big models. Okay. What you see the slowness is they actually want kind of a very uh, big computation power. That is one thing because that is why mostly because they have been uh, cloud services because you can get a uh, you know, good uh, computational uh, footprint, uh, hardware footprint. So mostly, yes, local services are slow. That is true. Improvements, one thing you can do is uh, you need to improve on the prompting. So the prompt uh, issues are there. So prompt optimization should be done. Most of the people we have seen this. Uh, if your prompt is not optimized, that affects a lot to the ML because uh, first of all, the model has to understand the prompt. So if you have issues in the prompt, uh, the prompt is not optimized, it affects the uh, model performance. That is one thing. And computation capacity, uh, it's one of the biggest. Yes. Uh, Running it locally, what I meant was not running in the basic, you know, the normal ones uh, here. So what I meant was if you feel like, no, I don't want to go for any cloud services. If you feel like, oh, no cloud services, then only option you have is you have to invest on computer resources. You don't need to have, say, maybe large uh, GPU service servers, but uh, there are minimum uh, resources for these models. And you have to run them locally, not in a normal computers. In a technically, we don't run it in a computer. We have to go for a server. And the other option we have is uh, locally means you can go for local clouds as well as you can host them in say Azure Google uh, services. So once you host them in your VMs, it runs. So you are the one who's actually managing your uh, resources. So there, since you are hosting the models in your VMs. So the data will not actually go out. So that is also one option. So practically, you can't uh, post these, you know, Lama models and these uh, 175B models. It's actually practically impossible to run it in a normal way. They don't even know. Okay. So accuracy um, is like this. When it comes, to what we do is medical scenarios. There are scenarios. Scenarios where we can actually uh, come up with that. Way. There are scenarios we go ahead with uh, heuristics. Now, for example, these are uh, classification, the drug classifications. Uh, you go ahead with uh, vitamins and non vitamins, vitamins, non vitamins, and cosmetic elements. So, uh, in that case, what we do is we do with in project wise, we go ahead with POC and then we go for UAT and then we. Uh, have our own medical staff, medical uh, practitioners. So, so with that, we check, okay, uh, we select a uh, set of details and we go ahead with the normal accuracy uh, based methods. Otherwise, you know, there's no other way. If you want to compare LLM, there's a separate story, but in this uh, medical, uh, say the drug categorization, what we did was we did a POC and then we went for a UAT with the uh, production ready model. And uh, we send it to our uh, practitioners. So they are the ones actually doing it manually. So uh, we had parallel runs, okay, parallel runs. And then at the end, we got the reports, okay, what are the things it classified, misclassified. And uh, uh, most of the uh, details we got was uh, quite good uh, in terms of the medicals. We didn't actually, uh, most of the things we didn't see uh, misclassified. It's, Drugs wise, uh, it's pretty easy to uh, classify uh, into cosmetics and vitamins. In that scenario. Okay, so LLM, there's a number. So, when it comes to data factory and so data warehousing, 
we we had a uh, one use case where in our financial sector we actually have some regulations that means uh, we can't take the financial data into cloud services that that's a government regulation so uh, we did actually a poc that's actually in the uh, level and not the poc level where we actually we have to identify what are the personal information so uh, because we can't take those data but the transactional data we can take them uh, if we don't have any personal information so we got the help from llm plus some other models to detect what are the personal information where we can take we cannot take plus because now we have the regulations so what we did was we incorporate the regulations plus the data and then uh, we check okay what are the information we can cover with the regulation what are the information we cannot cover with the regulation so uh, you know data splitting and data detection so the personal information detection actually we use uh, recently we started working on the llm so that uh, we can bring uh, get some data into our cloud because uh, we have huge data set we have still we are in on premise uh, services but if we can remove this uh, personal information and everything which is okay uh, with the uh, regulations we can uh, bring them to cloud for our analytical purposes so that's what we can do one thing with the uh, llms and then if you have any questions further i I think I have my LinkedIn profile that you are going to there, so you can simply uh, send me any question by LinkedIn. I'm more than happy to uh, share. Exactly as well, so we can reach out to you also. I yes, I think I just. So if you have anything, you can. Yeah.